Let me read to you a passage from the 16th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 15 to 20. It's the Gospel of the Feast of St. Mark the Evangelist, normally celebrated on April the 25th. St. Mark writes, Jesus said to the eleven, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then his disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. That's from Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20, for the feast of St. Mark the Evangelist. It reminds us of extraordinary features of the beginning of the Church of Christianity. What do I mean? Well, Plato was born at Athens in 428 or 427 BC. When he was about 20 years old, he met Socrates, and this was the decisive influence in Plato's philosophical career. After the death of Socrates, he joined some Socratic disciples, gathered at Megara, under the leadership of Euclid. Later he travelled in Egypt, Greater Greece and Sicily. Eventually he returned to Athens in the groves near the gymnasium of Academus. He devoted himself unremittingly to writing and teaching until his 80th year when, as Cicero tells us, he died in the midst of his intellectual labours. Plato's school was organised by Plato himself and handed over at the time of his death to his nephew Spusippus. It was then known as the Academy because it met in the groves of Academus. The Academy continued first at Athens and later at Alexandria until the first century of the Christian era. With the advent of Neoplatonism, founded by Ammonius and developed by Plotinus, Platonism definitely entered the cause of paganism against Christianity. Nevertheless, the great majority of the Christian philosophers, down to St. Augustine, were Platonists. I mention Plato and the growth of his philosophical school merely as one of many intellectual movements that could be cited. No one has ever claimed that there was anything especially remarkable about the growth of Platonism. It was an exceptionally valuable philosophy, and its historical influence over time was as could be expected. The same could be said of Aristotle and his school. There have been parallels to a greater or lesser extent in the realm of religion. Buddha sought the path of enlightenment and, as he understood it to be, attained it. He gathered disciples and the movement grew. It's va it is vast and varied and it continues to attract disciples. Buddhism, as exemplified in the current Dalai Lama, is popular among many in the West. Zoroastrianism has endured to our day, but without a commanding following. There have been countless intellectual and religious movements in history, rising and falling, enduring and petering out to a trickle, or continuing to hold great numbers. A question might be, which among these is of God? All purport to bring wisdom to mankind, and a key to salvation in some sense or other. Is there anything about the beginning and growth of this or that among them, which might strongly suggest that God himself began it and gave to it the growth. Is there anything to show that it was more than human in origin? Well, let us ask this. 
What would have happened to Platonism, or to the school of Aristotle, or to Zoroastrianism, or to Buddhism, or to Islam, had their founders been crucified two or three years after the commencement of their public careers? With sincere respect to our Muslim brothers, what would have happened if Muhammad had been arrested a couple of years after his great religious experiences, if he had been beaten cruelly, absolutely rejected by the powers that be, and then put to a shameful death? Islam would respond to the question by saying that such a thing would never have been allowed by God because Muhammad was a prophet, the greatest and holiest of them. It could never have happened. But what if it had? What then would have happened to the new religion? Just as much to the point, perhaps, what would have happened if in the early years Muhammad had no access to military force in his conflicts with his opponents? What would have happened if early Islam had had no means of recourse to armies and military prowess? All of this brings us to our Gospel that I read earlier from Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. A striking change suddenly occurred during the period immediately following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the first Easter tide. Christ had deliberately stepped into the danger zone of his opponents in order to bear witness before the highest tribunal of the nation to his being the Messiah and Son of God. The result, which he had predicted, was his summary and brutal end. There he lay hanging on the cross, and then dead in the tomb. It was all over. His crushed and demoralised disciples were utterly incapable of any action, let alone any public acknowledgement to all and sundry of their dead master. The whole thing was finished, and it was a tremendous disappointment. But what happened? Without any means, they suddenly were found to be vigorously and joyfully telling to all that this same Jesus was risen from the dead, that he was Lord and Messiah, and that to believe in his name was the path to life everlasting. They had begun a vast endeavour to make all nations his disciples. I'm not sure that there has been anything like it in the history of the world. Appearing with the most miserable of beginnings, it became joyful, intrepid, unstoppable. Not only was there this extraordinary transformation of his disciples, but in those first three centuries, the constantly persecuted church went on to conquer. This happened not by arms and armies, but by ordinary believers bearing witness amid persecution. On the Friday, all was gloom. By the Sunday, all was joy. Within a short time, the crucified and risen Jesus' disciples were on a vigorous march in every direction of the known world. They had a mission to which they dedicated their lives to the point of blood. It was to fulfil the charge given to them to make other disciples of their risen Master. Go into the whole world and preach the good news to all creation, the risen Jesus had said to them. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Then after Jesus ascended into heaven, we read, the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. Clearly, the work was God's work. Let us begin it then.